And now, just as you accepted Christ Jesus as your Lord, you must continue to follow him. Let your roots grow down into him and let your lives be built on him. Then your faith will grow strong in the truth that you were taught, and you will overflow with thankfulness. Don't let anyone capture you with empty philosophies and high-sounding nonsense that come from human thinking and from the spiritual powers of this world, rather than from Christ. For in Christ lives all the fullness of God in a human body. So you also are complete through your union with Christ, who is the head over every ruler and authority. When you came to Christ, you were circumcised, but not by a physical procedure. Christ performed a spiritual circumcision, the cutting away of your sinful nature. For you were buried with Christ when you were baptized. And with him you were raised to new life, because you trusted the mighty power of God, who raised Christ from the dead. You were sin because of your sins, and because your sinful nature was not yet cut away, then God made you alive with Christ. For he forgave all our sins. He canceled the record of the charges against us and took it away by nailing it to the cross. Thanks, John. Thank you, music team. Thank you for all those of you who have participated so far. We're going to dive right in today, and I want to start off by letting you know, and so I've told this story before, but for some of you who may be new, uh, when I was 13, I secured a line of credit at a, a local store in Marwane, where I grew up, little farmer town. Can you now picture that, 13 years old and you have a line of credit, okay? Uh, and so I would go there and I would buy my hoagie. It didn't look nearly this good. You know the stuff I'm talking about, right? In the package, you put it in a microwave, the end is dried and crusty and the other is slop, <laughs> right? You know, that's right, yeah. Okay, didn't look anything like that. Anyway, so I'd buy my hoagie and my chips and my cherry Coke. I might even rent a movie. That's right, I'm that old. <laughs> and I didn't need a wallet. I'd just, go, I'd just go to the counter, and she would add up all the things that I, I took, and I'd walk out the door, 13 years old. And I would come back after a week or two, and I would pay her out of my vast fortune of $3 a day delivering newspapers. Because I'm that old. $3 a day. Anyway, I'd pay her. Now, I, I knew this. I knew what many of you already know. You want to keep your debt below your ability to pay. Correct? Right. Now, what if I didn't have enough money to pay her. That would have caused a relational problem between myself and the store owner. And some of us understand this, living on the edge of debt, because many of us, and I'm being serious now, many of us are one sickness, one unexpected bill, one clerical error away from debt consuming us. That's the state that some of us are in. But this morning, we're not talking about financial debt. We're talking about a different kind of debt. And we are preparing in this series for Good Friday and for Easter Sunday. We're talking about what about the cross? Because the cross is this wonderful kaleidoscope of things that Christ did for you and I that we often don't think too much about. Let's recap a bit. So far in this series, we've learned this. The cross ended the curse of death, eternal separation from God. He vanquished the fear of death. You and I don't have to walk around being afraid of, of dying. He freed us from the world's value vortex. Remember what those were? Power, popularity, and pleasure. Remember? That's the world's value vortex. And he brought us, we looked at this last week, he brought us near to God and to each other. You know the elevator? That's, this is, these are all the things that the cross has done. We're only halfway through this series. And this is all the things the Bible tells us, that God's telling us that Jesus did for us on the cross. So when we celebrate the cross, it is a rich 
rich event filled with marvelous things that God has done for us. Today, we're looking at the freedom from debt. Speaking of debt, this face may be familiar to some. This is Bill Maher. He's a pundit. And this is what he had to say. He said, I just don't get it. The thought of someone else cleansing me of my sins is ridiculous. I don't need anyone to cleanse me. I can cleanse myself. In short, I have enough. I can pay my own debts. He's not the only person who feels that way. Then there's Warren Buffett, one of the richest men on the planet. He had a similar thought. After donating 85% of his $44 billion to charity, wow, that's a lot of cash, he said, there is more than one way to get to heaven, no, nope. but, but this is a great way. Hmm. Here's a little known Bible fact. We are all born indebted. We are all born indebted. And we are drilling into a crucial teaching of Christianity. This is called the doctrine of atonement. That is a big word. You can, you can just impress all your family and friends by using this word, atonement. Some people find it easier to remember if you break it into at one moment. At one moment, because this is a state of harmony between God and humans. But this is a debt that is causing relational tension between humans and God, and it has to be paid. Because our debt towards God is far bigger than a few cherry cokes and movie rentals. And it's a major problem for two reasons. The first reason is this. We are born owing God everything. Think about that for a moment. We are born owing God everything already. Every thought, every ounce of energy, every dollar that we will ever earn is already His. In other words, we have nothing to pay God with. Zero collateral. We are, in, we are perpetually, personally bankrupt. Everything good that we have comes from Him. Everything good that we do is because of Him. We have nothing to pay God with above what is already His. You can start to see the problem that we humans are having, right? And here's the second one. Our debt is too big. You see, because sin is not just an act of disobedience like talking during class, right? The Bible describes sin like it's cosmic treason. It is a defiance. It is a claim to the throne. It is an infinite crime. So the question before us is how does one pay for an infinite debt with no money, with no way of ever earning money? And not only are we born into sin, but we accrue additional debt with selfishness, deception, and defiance. And we start these things when we're about that high. No lessons needed. We come by it naturally, do we not? Many, now the problem is many of our loved ones mistakenly assume either their debt is non-existent or it's more like cherry coke debt. I got enough. I can pay this. Kind of like Bill Maher, right? I've got enough. I can pay for this. It's all right. Now, take all that, put it aside for one moment. Particular problems. Let's talk about particular problems. Particular problems require particular solutions, correct? Such as pumping up your tires will not fix your oil leak, right? Memorizing times tables will not cure your diabetes. Some problems have only one solution, just like medicine may only cure one thing. Our debt, cosmic treason, will not be paid for with a $44 billion donation or by the sincere delusion of having enough. We cannot pay God with worship service attendance 
or Bible reading or being a good person or being on the right side of history. We cannot pay. Now, logically, now follow me on this one. Logically, if we are born owing everything with no way to pay, our debt can only be paid from a source outside of us. Make sense? Okay. Since cosmic treason is an infinite crime, the debt payment will also have to be infinite in value. Hmm? And now we get to the cross. Ask the average churchgoer what Jesus did on the cross, and you will likely, this, today's message will likely be the most mentioned. It's the forgiveness of sins. It's the payment of debts. And there, this is an essential truth to the gospel of Jesus Christ. It's vital to the good news. And there's three aspects of this payment on our behalf. Three aspects of this payment. The cross was intentional. Jesus was, not just, Jesus was not a victim of circumstance. He didn't stumble into the role of Savior. It didn't take him by surprise. You know, at 10 years old when he was in the temple, he didn't, you know, look to heaven and say, God, you want me to do what? No. It says this. Jesus offered himself as a sacrifice for people's sins. He was not, and, and atheists will sometimes argue this, that Jesus was the victim of parental abuse. The Father sent him unwillingly to the cross, made him. But that's not the picture that, that we get in the Bible. It says Jesus offered himself over his own free will. Why did he do it? We know what real love is because Jesus gave up his life for us. He did it out of love. He was motivated by love for you, and he offered himself willingly. No one, by the way, has ever loved you like that. And more than that, no one will ever love you like that. Jesus offered more than anyone on this planet ever could for you. His love is amazing. Now, as God, He had options. Jesus had options. He could have opted out during the whipping, during the crown, during the beating, during His march to Golgotha, during the nails, or the worst part about the cross, which was the separation from His Father. He could have opted out at any point, but He stayed because He was willing and because He loved us. It's one of the most amazing things. I don't know about you, if, if, if there's an amazing thing in the Bible, it's that God loves us. You've met us, right? <laughs> the fact that God loves, loves you, that's amazing. So the cross was intentional. The cross was also purposeful. He was clear on His goal for you. So what we read in Peter wrote to the church, he said, Christ suffered for our sins once for all time. He never sinned, but he died for sinners. Why? To bring you safely home to God. You know, one of the things I love about my church family here in Nanaimo, this church has shown me, I know I've been here almost seven years, has shown me time and time again, this church cares about the poor. Great compassion for the homeless, because we know that at having a home is a place of safety, belonging, and acceptance, and being known. Here's one more Bible fact. All of us are born homeless. Oh, we may have a house, but we are born homeless which explains our anxiety, our insecurity, our judgments of other people. We're always looking for something just beyond our reach, a happiness that never seems to come even when we get what we think we want. Because in the Bible, home is not a building. Home is not even a place. And it's not even heaven in the sense of this, what many pict people picture as an all-inclusive resort in the sky, right? It's not that. 
In the Bible, home is what? Home is a person. Home is a person. Home is God. Jesus went to the cross to bring us home to a person, not a place of safety, a person of safety. Not a place of belonging so much as a person of belonging and acceptance and being known. How can Jesus bring us home to the Father? He, he prayed, I give myself as a holy sacrifice for them so they can be made holy by your truth. See, the cross perfected us. The cross made us holy in God's sight, at one with God. There's that at one moment again. You know the difference between someone who is holier than thou and a Christian? The Christian knows that their holiness comes from Jesus' decision to sacrifice himself on the cross. A holier than thou person thinks their holiness comes from their own decisions, their own morality, their own payment plan. The cross was intentional, the cross was purposeful to bring us home to our Father in holiness, and the cross was effective. The cross is a universal fix-it project that worked to perfection. Now watch this. Since, this is Paul writing to the church in Rome, he says, since we have been made right in God's sight by the blood of Christ, He will certainly save us from God's condemnation. Now, read that again. Since we have been made with have been made right in God's sight. Is that past, present, or future? This is not a trick question. We have been made, past tense. It's done. It's over. Here's Paul writing in the first century, and he's saying, we have been made right because of the cross. That is good news for all of us. There it is, at one moment, being made right, relationship restored, all systems go. How? The cross. The debt has been paid. He is ours and we are His forever. We have been made holy, brought home because of the cross. It's already accomplished for all who repent and trust, for all who turn from sin and turn to God. Now, what happened on that Friday? Let's dig a little deeper into this because this gets right weird. Jackie, thank you for using that word. Where are you? You call the Bible weird. There's weird stuff in here. It's true. Anyone who thinks they got it all figured out needs to keep on reading, I'd say. Here's what it says. He, meaning Jesus, Jesus personally carried our sins in His body on the cross so that we can be dead to sin and live for what is right. Total transformation. By His wounds, you are healed. You are healed. See, in the New Testament, God uses the right tool for the right job. A particular problem requires a particular solution. Humans sinned, so only a human could pay the penalty. Right? But God already owned everything, including our lives. So how could any human pay? Only God taking human form, allowing our infinite debt to be transferred to Christ's body could carry our sins. This is mysterious. If you want to explain that to me, I'm wide open. It says in Colossians, He canceled the record of the charges against us and took it away by nailing it to the cross. The charges against you, the charges against me. Now, here's the thing about crucifixion that a lot of people don't know. Crucifixion was not just a means to deliver death. It was a means to deliver torture and humiliation and to send a message. All four of the biographies of Jesus' life say that the charges against Jesus were placed above Him for all to read. When you cross Rome, they put the charges up there for everyone to see. And the message is, don't do what this poor sap did or you'll be next. 
It's a pretty effective means of communication, don't you think? But for Jesus, there was also an infinite debt list that was attached. Your sins and mine were also there that day. A number of sins that only God can know and only God could pay for with His life. You and I have been adding debt our whole life. From the time we could defy our parents and show selfishness, mine, and lie with no training, we have been committing cosmic treason. We have been communicating our desire since we were children to be in charge. We already go, oh God, absolute loyalty, unwavering obedience. Now, you might be here today, and maybe you got dragged into this service. I'm still glad you're here. Um, but you might be thinking, you know, Pastor, you, you, you've kind of gone off the deep end here. Um, I think you're exaggerating because, you know, my sins are not that bad. I don't owe that much. It's more like cherry Coke debt. I'm kind of with Bill Maher on this. I have enough. I'll be okay. I'm pretty confident that when I stand before God, He's going to give me the thumbs up and, you know, come on in. Hmm. I would say Jesus would vehemently disagree. Jesus often used the Old Testament law to show our sinfulness, to show our debt. And He did the radical thing of going past our actions into matters of the heart that even our intentions, our motivations, our desires are cosmic treason. He said, you've heard that murder is wrong, right? Well, hating someone is just as bad. You've heard that adultery is bad. Well, lust is just as bad. Our hearts commit cosmic treason. Every judgmental thought, every shred of superiority, Every time we envy or slander or desire for vengeance without, and get this, without saying a word or doing a thing, we are accruing an infinite debt. Every time we do that, we're saying, I want to be in charge. I would do better if I was in charge. It's treason, and it all must be accounted for. Every thought, word, and action that you and I have had was placed on the cross of Christ. All those charges against us, all that capital, all those capital offenses, each treasonous crime, the charges were infinite. So, only an infinite payment would cancel that debt. Only God in human form could satisfy the right category of person, had to be human, and the right value, an infinite God of glory. So only in this God-man could our debt be paid. And here's the beautiful thing. Now, if you're feeling kind of bad, I'm going to lift your spirits here. I'm hoping God's going to lift your spirits here. Because this The forgiveness of your debt is what God has always wanted to do. It says this in Galatians 1.4, Jesus gave His life for our sins just as God our Father planned in order to rescue us from this evil world in which we live. All glory to God forever and ever. Amen. You know, you only need to rescue people who are in peril, right? Who are in danger. And it says that's what God did for us. He saw that we were in danger. He rescued us. This was His plan. Hebrews 10.10 says, "For, For God's will was for us to be made holy. What's God's will for my life? For me to be made holy, for you to be made holy. How? By the sacrifice of the body of Jesus Christ once for all time. It's God's will for you to be made holy, to come home. To come home. This is what He has always wanted for you. Before you were ever born, this is what God wanted for you, to come home. And this was only 
This was the only plan. There was no backup plan. Only God could save us. And not everyone is willing to accept this. In fact, this is ridiculous to some. Do you know what the earliest depiction of Christ on the cross is? It comes from about 200 A.D. You might be a little surprised at what it looks like. This was found near Palatine Hill in Rome, now in, Palat- now in the Palatine Museum. So you can go and see this today. It's a depiction of a man on the cross with a donkey's head. And the caption reads, Alexamenos worships his God. See, in that culture and in ours, gods are supposed to be strong. Gods are supposed to be powerful. They are supposed to destroy their enemies. The idea of a god on a cross is ridiculous. But Jesus is the one who did something quite unexpected. He brought the great reversal, the great reversal where glory comes through humiliation, where exaltation is birthed through shame, and strength is found in weakness, and life is found in death, and victory is secured through surrender. This is the great reversal that Jesus brought. I really hope, and I know many of you do too, that Bill Maher finds Jesus and sees that his debt is way too pay, way too big to pay himself. It goes way beyond cherry coke debt. And I hope that Warren Buffett realizes that all the donated money in the world cannot pay for his debt. It cannot bring him home to God. And I hope for everyone in this room and everyone who's watching this, I hope you see that the cross is the only way to at one to have a right relationship, to have your debt paid, the only way to come home. Your sins were nailed to the cross, but you know what? This is not enough. You must trust personally that this is the way for you, that this will be your payment, that this is your debt cancellation. Thankfully, thankfully, at the end of time, unlike my childhood store owner, there will be no debt to calculate for those who are trusting in Christ. No logbook to consult, no adding required, no fear of having, uh, not having enough to pay. On Judgment Day, followers of Jesus, many of us in this room, will come to God with our hands open, our pockets empty, and with childlike trust. And God will delight in that trust. It is a trust that Jesus paid for you, an infinite payment for an infinite debt. He lived the perfect life that we couldn't. He died the death that every one of us deserved. And you can humbly accept His payment on your behalf. Because of that, you and I can find forgiveness, be released from our guilt and our shame. And here's what the cross can mean for you as I wrap up. Here's what it means. Listen carefully. You can say this to yourself. I don't have to worry about my debt, and I no longer wonder if God cares about me. If you walked away with those two things this morning, it will change your life. It will change everything. It will change the outlook of your week. I'll say it again. I don't have to worry about my debt, and I no longer wonder if God cares about me. That's what the cross means to you. That's why we have one here to remind us of those truths. Tim Keller wrote the book, The Reason for God, and he said this, The fact that Jesus had to die for me humbled me out of my pride. The fact that Jesus was glad to die for me assured me out of my fear. 
We are about to remember the cross of Christ. We are about to celebrate what Jesus has done for us. If you are serving this morning, please make your way to your stations. And just as a matter of house cleaning, before we do that, I want to remind all of you, when you have your empty cup, to take it to the back on your way out and put it in the basket. Um, that would greatly help us all out. We have been talking about the cross and how it affects us individually, but I want to talk about something else as we wrap up here this morning, as we remember the cross. See, the cross is not just about us as individuals, right? The cross is also about us together. I want to go back to a verse that I, that I spoke about in this message. Since we have been made right in God's sight by the blood of Christ, He will certainly save us from God's combination. Uh, condemnation, sorry. Notice the second word, we. Since we have been made right. The infinite debt has been paid. The result is atonement. You know, we call this communion. It's communal. We celebrate it together. And we celebrate it worldwide. When we come to the cross... And we remember that we have been made right in God's sight by the blood of Christ. There is no room for superiority, nor is there room for inferiority. We have been made right in God's sight by the blood of Christ together. You are no better and no worse. You have been made holy. You have been brought home by the cross just like your brothers and sisters in this room. All of us had an infinite debt, myself included. And that required an infinite payment, a particular problem that required a particular solution. Now, before you get up, and we are going to remember the, the, the cross here, and if you are new here this morning, don't worry about it. If, if you don't know Jesus yet, we're just glad you're here. Don't feel any pressure. You can just stay seated. But if you are a follower of Jesus, you're going to get up to the, and go to the station that's closest to you. You're going to be handed a cracker that represents Christ's body, juice that represents the blood of the new covenant. But before you do that, I want you to reflect on this verse. And I want you to say, Thank you for making us all right with you, Lord. All. We are in this together. We are a family, a family forever. Let us remember the cross of Christ together. Go ahead and go to your station. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you that the cross means that forever, whoever turns to you in repentance has been made right because of the cross. There's no room in this church or any other church for superiority or inferiority. We all had an infinite debt to pay, which you paid on our behalf. And we are forever grateful, Jesus, that your body was broken for us, that your blood was spilled for us. We continue to owe you everything. Jesus said, take and eat. This is my body. Take and drink. This is the blood of the new covenant. Lord, we are forever in your debt. And we are grateful that you paid the infinite debt with an infinite payment. I pray, Lord, that the people who have heard this message will leave here with a great sense of hope, a great sense of forgiveness, 
and a great longing to be home. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.